Welcome to the Truth and Grace Counseling Podcast. Truth and Grace Counseling exists to provide clarity from a biblically informed perspective in order to help individuals engage life faithfully. Let's go. Hello, and welcome to episode six of the Truth and Grace Counseling Podcast. On today's episode, I talk about this sweet new shirt that I have, talk about tractors. Am I going to buy a tractor? We talk about home improvement stores and how I'm becoming more and more like my dad as I get older. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's like that. Also talk about direct primary cares. Have you ever heard of that before? No, check the water cooler. We'll talk more about it. In the meat section, I talk with Soad about conservatism, how it's different being a conservative counselor, and how conservatives can really be complaining too much. Do you agree with that? The last word, we talk about accountability and why many of us don't do a very good job of being accountable for our actions. All right. With that being said, I'll catch you at the water cooler. The water cooler. Hi, and welcome to the water cooler. This is the part of the podcast where just kind of Take it easy, talk about a few things going on in my life, kind of a a low-key start to the podcast. Let me start with this pretty cool new polo shirt I have on. So right here you can see, well, again, I'm going to chastise you audio-only people. You can't see this, but if you're on video, you can see here the Truth and Grace Counseling little polo um, that, that I have here. I got it embroidered. Um, I am part of the Wichita Falls Chamber of Commerce. I live in Duncan, Oklahoma, and Wichita Falls is roughly an hour, hour and 15 minutes away from Duncan, just just south of the the Red River. And I joined there because I'm licensed in Texas as well, and it's the nearest town of, of, you know, a bigger size. It's north of 100,000 population there. So anyways, I got connected with a... um, a local clothing place called Bro Crow Creative, and they do all sorts of t-shirts and mugs and, and, and different things like that of slapping logos on, on different things. So I reached out to them and they made this for me and a pullover that I have the kind of the, the TG logo um, that I, I use for most of my things. So anyways, this is just the classic Truth and Grace counseling there. And I, I think it came out really nice. So shout out to them if you have any um, logo needs or whatever, want, want some t-shirts made and you're in Wichita Fall areas or not, I'll link their information down below and, and you can check them out. Moving on to just a topic that's neither here nor there, just something that I've been thinking about lately. As some of you may know, my wife and I, we purchased some property just outside of Duncan. It's If you're familiar with the area, it's actually in Empire. Now, Empire, there is a city limits of Empire City, um, which, hey, you hear city, it must be a big area. No, no, it's not. It's very, very, very tiny. There's really not much of anything in Empire City, including, I believe, any part of the Empire School District. I don't think any of that's an actual Empire City. Empire is really just a tiny little community. And again, those in the area of Duncan, they know what I'm talking about. But we bought some property out there just shy of 13 acres. I believe it's 12.85 acres. And hopefully in this next year or so, we'll move out there. Um, you'll actually hear me talk with my guest Soad later on this episode of how I, I'll check the mortgage rates pretty often because they've if you've been under a rock, you may not know that the mortgage rates have been higher along with inflation. And it's just made it very difficult to build a new house because things are just very expensive. And um, that I'm sure you're all well aware of how expensive things have been lately, including the eggs. I think those are starting to come down a little bit, but things are expensive and uh, the houses are expensive anyways. So it's just made it very difficult to, to move there. Anyways, that's kind of a rambling introduction to talk about how I've looked a lot into tractors here recently because, like I said, we're going to have almost 13 acres. A tractor is not a mandatory expense to have on that amount of land. It's not like I have to have it. For one, I want to because, I mean, I'm kind of 
channeling in the inner boy of myself that uh, they're they're just cool. They're they're really the Swiss Army knife of the the vehicle world. They can do just about anything from lifting things to digging to mowing, just just pushing stuff around. That they're, they're they're cool little little machines there. So been looking at some Kubotas. If you know anything about about Kubotas, they're the the orange one. John Deere is the the biggest one. That's they're the green ones. That's, that's the green tractor. So been looking at the orange one. Um, don't know when or if I'll, I'll buy a Kubota, but just interested if, uh, if if any of you have bought any tractors or looked into that. Um, when we first move out, we may not buy. We may just uh, r- rent a tractor to you know kind of get the the grass under control, do some lane management stuff, but. Anyways, um, neither here nor there. I just have spent a lot of time on Kubota website here recently. If you're into this at all, Messix, which is a Kubota dealership, and they're also a New Holland dealership, somewhere in New England-ish area. I don't entirely know, but they're kind of the go-to with uh, just different Kubota type of videos. So I've been watching them a lot. I'm going to link them down there. If they want to say hi to me, that's great, but um, they, they get a lot of viewers. But um, anyways, th- some interesting stuff. Uh, I'll link them. If you're just curious to know how some of these tractors work, it's it's pretty interesting things. And this really leads me into um, just this topic of kind of seeing myself growing older, getting more mature, seeing my interests changing. When I was a kid, about the most torturous event for me was going to Lowe's. I hated Lowe's. There were no toys. There's no TVs to catch up on a game or video game systems to play with. You just walk around and look at wood and fixtures and all the boring stuff. And I remember thinking as a kid, man, when I'm an adult, I'll never go to Lowe's. This is stupid. (laughs) And would you look at here now? Um, I really enjoyed going to Lowe's or Home Depot, just kind of checking around. We we did some... uh, pretty major home improvement in our kitchen about five or so years ago. So was well adept of going to Lowe's back during those days. But even still now that there's times I'll go to the websites or, you know, if I'm near a store, just walking around looking at stuff, especially with our new build happening in the next year or so. It's just fun. It's kind of fun to, to walk around and dream and, and try to come up with some different home improvement type of ideas. So I'm curious uh, for you, what what are your thoughts on some of these big box um, home improvement type of stores? And aside from that, have you seen differences in your life? Things that you hated as a kid that as an adult, you're like, wow, this is this is actually pretty cool. I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that uh, my my opinions have completely 180'd on, on some things. And kind of reminds me of some of those commercials about, uh, I think it's Geico. You know, they have a million commercials out there. But um, one, one of those insurance type of companies that w- that has that uh, commercial about becoming your parents. Um, and, and that's really what I felt like uh, as I got older. Like, oh, well, I guess I'm becoming like my dad and enjoying doing home home improvement type of things. The uh, the last thing I wanted to throw your way, um, this is something I, I was talking about to one of my friends and something I'm just super passionate about. Have you heard of something called direct primary care? If you haven't, you're not alone. I think most people haven't. So I'm not going to do this full justice and in, in, in gross detail, but Basically, a normal primary care, the way it works, you come in, you get your your insurance checked, and if they accept your insurance, great. They move you in, bill your insurance, you have a co-payment, all all that good stuff. And if you don't, then you either pay an, an absurd amount of money or they just don't see you. And it, it even when you do have good insurance, you're just kind of herded along. Um, you, you wait in line a long time, and then you see the doctor, and you see him, what, maybe five minutes tops? And you just feel like they're constantly in a rush. You, you never get that great of care. And and I'm not really really trying to badmouth the doctors here. I think they're just put in a rough situation that their model of business is, how do I get as many people in and out through that door as possible? And as a consumer, like, well, did they really listen to me? Did we really get to the bottom of it? I don't know. Are they just pushing prescriptions on me? There's just a lot of questions. So 
there's something called direct primary care that operates fundamentally different. There are no regular office type of fees in this structure. The way it works is on a subscription based model. You can think of it kind of like a retainer for an attorney. Or if you go the entertainment route, it's like a subscription service that you'd have like a like a Netflix or Disney Plus or any of these streaming type of sites. So what my family and I, what we do is we have a subscription, so to speak, with a doctor here in town. His, his name is Dr. Rose Kelly. I'll put his stuff down here just in case you're in the area. Um, but there's other uh, direct primary cares around too. I'll, I'll put a little locator um, down in the description to see if you're interested in finding one near you. So they all have the same type of format and they may operate individually a little bit different. But anyways, the way it works, we paid that one subscription fee and uh, doctors might do it a little bit different. Um, the way ours does, it's a set amount based off of age. So it's something like zero to 17 is $20 a month. And uh, I don't know this. I'm just throwing numbers out there. 20 to 40 is 40 a month. And uh, 40 to 60 is 80 a month. So, so on and so forth. And basically, the older you get, the more expensive it gets, which makes sense because typically the older you are, the uh, more health issues you have. But that is the only cost that you pay to see the doctor. For us, at any point, if I am running out of medicine or if I'm just not feeling well, I can text the doctor and we can either set up a time for us to meet or he can prescribe me medication just through the, the text, um, or we can set up a phone call. It, th there's just a lot of flexibility there. But I don't have to worry about, oh, how much is that going to be billed? What, what's the cost going to be? All I pay is that monthly due, which granted, you pay that whether you see the doctor or not. I said they're kind of like on retainer. But the flip side is, if you need to use the doctor, you don't have to worry about it. It's already paid for. That's baked in there. Aside from that, the only other payment would be if it, there's any other services that are needed. Like um, if I have to uh, get stitches, that's something he can do. Is If I have some type of fall and get my forehead broken open or whatever and it just needs a few stitches, that's something that he could do. If I need a blood test taken, that's something that they can do too. get that set up. And I would pay those fees, which mind you, they I can't guarantee what this will be for everyone else. But the ones my doctor get, the fees are for these services are stupidly lower than what they are at, at the doctor's office or, or at the uh, at the hospital. They get a much, much, much more discounted rate in part because they're going through cash. There's no insurance exchanged in any of this. You can still have insurance, but this is all cash-based. So it takes that third party out of it, and it drastically, drastically lowers cost, and it lowers the time. Things just You don't have to wait for pre-approval for things. You just go and do it. Super, super convenient. And anyways, um, it's super predictable. You know what to expect. We combine it with a service called Samaritan Ministries, and I'll, I'll include their information down there too. This one is Christian-based, so you have to not only profess to be a Christian, but you have to be actively involved. And, and they do check up on that, so it's not just you check the box, say, yeah, yeah, I actually do it. No, like the, you actually have to put your pastor's information and everything. So it is kind of a more stringent way to get in, but from there, it's you pay a share amount, which think of that like your premium. Um, that stays the same. And if you need to use... Um, if you need any reimbursement for anything, you need to use the doctor, go to the hospital or whatever. Like for my wife, for instance, she's using um, a midwife this go around I, and we're doing a, a home birth. And this it's actually the, uh, the wife of um, our direct primary care doctor. And anyways, she's already given us the itemized bill for what that will cost. We send that to Samaritans we're in the process of this right now. Samaritans will review it. Then we will get paid back from Samaritans what that due is. So anyways, basically what 
I'm trying to get a, across here is if you're having a bad time with insurance, you're just so frustrated at of all the bureaucracy and the red tape and just the lack of care that you're getting from some of these places. There are ways to get around that. You have to do a little bit of homework. You have to do some research. But I'll tell you, with my direct primary care, I would gladly double the amount of that subscription cost and still do it. It, it is life changing because you you fundamentally approach healthcare differently. When I am at the typical primary care, I try to avoid there because I don't want to have added cost and I hate going to the doctor's office. It's a painful experience. So let me try to limit the amount of time I go there at all possible. Whereas on the direct primary care side, I've already paid for it. So if I need something, why don't I go ahead and just give a text? And, and sometimes you don't even have to have a, a, a time that you go in the office. Um, sometimes it could just be done over the phone. It might take you five minutes and he's already got that prescription written up for you. So anyways, I'll include that uh, information down below. Dr. Rose Kelly, if you're in the, the Duncan area, but also if you are throughout the United States, there is a direct primary care kind of locator type of thing. And I can't guarantee they'll function exactly the same way as my doctor, but the basic premise will be that way. Any direct primary care will kind of be that subscription type of model. So I really, really encourage everybody to look into that. I'll also include Samaritan Ministries. And there's other, health, that's called a health sharing network. There's other health sharing networks out there too, ones that don't require a, a, a Christian faith, other ones that do require a Christian, Christian faith, but just operate a little bit differently. But that's a great way to, to use as on top of having direct primary care um, of having a health sharing network on top of it. So I'm big on trying to not just whine about Pfizer and all these big pharma things and, oh, they're, they're so evil. Uh, so and I kind of talk about some of this in, in the meat section a little bit. That's It's good for us to point out some of those evils in, in the healthcare system, but don't just cry about it. Let's do something. So there are other alternatives out there to get you, I would argue, even better health care, um, but without having to do all the, the crazy things that the healthcare system makes you do. All that being said, I'm super excited to talk with Soad. Um, you'll get to know her a little bit more, and we'll go ahead and, and talk with her over in the meat section. The meat section. We're excited uh, to get started here in the meat section, and I have a special guest here today. So we have Soad Tabrizi. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she's licensed in eight states, which is pretty impressive. She's licensed in California, Florida, Idaho, Nevada, Montana, Utah, Virginia, and West Virginia. She's worked in the mental health field for 15 years. She's a certified addiction specialist, suicidologist, provides holistic alternatives with oils and natural su supplements. And I forgot to ask you to clarify this. I've heard this for many times, but is it Reiki? Reiki? I've never known how to pronounce that. It's Reiki. Reiki. Okay. Again, not yeah. too bad. <laughs> Reiki no, practitioner. Right. And she has a private practice that is 100% telehealth and also performs Reiki from her home to local clients. And uh, I've got a link there and I will uh, put her information down below so you can check her out. But so out. It's great to have you on today. Oh, it's so nice to be here, Johnny. Thank you so much. And do you like being called Johnny or John or do you have a preference? Yeah. That G great question. So um, I am actually the third, um, Johnny the third, Johnny Ray Sanders the third. So that is my actual name is Johnny. So oh, yeah, sweet. just call me Johnny. You got it. I like it. That works. Yeah. Thanks for having and me. I, yeah, sure. And um, again, n n neither here nor there, but uh, I've, I was asked my entire life since I'm the third and there's not too many thirds out there. Are you going to yeah. name yourself the fourth? And I, I've had that question, I said, my entire life. And my firstborn son is Elijah, and we're going to have another son named uh, Isaac. So the answer is no. We're, we're oh, done with wow. the, the reign of Johnny's. And I heard that you your wife was pregnant. I saw in one of the episodes that you've announced that. Congratulations. 
Thank you. Thank you. We are, we're super excited. Um, my wife is a, is a trooper and this is her, mm -hmm. so third pregnancy and it's probably easier to count the days she's been pregnant that she hasn't thrown up than the day <sighs> yeah. she has. Like she's just incredibly sick, but thankfully healthy, you know, not, yeah. it's not enviable, but she and Isaac are doing just fine. It's just, mm -hmm. it's rough. <laughs> rough I, bet her I had not heard about that condition she has. So that was yes. really interesting to see. I was like, Oh my God, the whole nine months. Yeah. She, uh, so she's seen a midwife this go around. Um, so I, I haven't told too many people this. We, in our local hospital, that's where our first two children were born. And that's where I was born too, actually. But huh. through COVID and just the, the craziness of the, the healthcare system, we're actually going with a midwife this go around and doing a home birth. And I'm so excited. Yeah. And uh, the midwife, which she's delivered, I don't know how many children, uh, a lot. Um, she said this is the worst case that she's seen um, of as far as sickness. So she is a, she's a special case, I guess. Poor baby. And no one likes to hear that. that you're the worst that I've ever seen. I mean, I'm sure that's not <laughs> settling for anybody to hear. No, but... She does say, uh, uh, the midwife is great. Um, she says that she has other uh, patients that might be a little overly complaining about things. And she's like, listen, you don't have it as bad as this other girl. <laughs> so she uses her as kind of a shaming mechanism there for them. That's awesome. <laughs> well, again, congratulations. And tell her I Thanks. said I wish her well and that it's not so, so bad for the whole duration. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate yeah. that. And we, we are, we are very, very grateful for, for one, my, my family lives here in town. My parents do. Mm -hmm. So they help us out and our church is fabulous. Um, it, it could be middle of the day. Hey, I don't, I can't watch the kids. And there's a woman over here, Prato, um, helping us clean and everything that they, they've been fantastic helping us. That out. is amazing. That is amazing. Good. Yes. Yes. Glad to hear it. Well, kind of jumping into things. I know you've watched some of this before. So, uh, so I kind of take this. We talk about serious issues, but I like to have more of a low-key, fun type of attitude. And this is the, the meat section of the podcast. It's the main part where we kind of dive into things. So I ask all my guests what their favorite kind of meat is. So I'm curious what yours is. It's so funny. I was thinking about this question too, kind of like what Pamela was saying, like, oh my God, I really uh -huh. thought about this one. So I did. I was like, what is, because I love meat, but I go through seasons of loving different types of meat. And right now I'm noticing my season is liver and specifically lamb liver. I am craving it 24 seven. I love it. I love cooking it. I make it right on the stove. It's one of my favorite things to make right now, and I have it quite often. So that is my favorite meat at the moment. Interesting. Now, how yeah. long has that – I know you said it's kind of changed around, but have you always been a liver fan, or is that a recent kind of yeah, so thing for my you? ethnicity is Persian, and so us Persians, we have liver as one of our – main foods that we barbecue actually a lot. So it's something that I grew up with, um, specifically lamb. We don't really do a uh, cow liver. Uh, we usually just do lamb. I mean, not that they don't, but it's just not preferred. The taste is very different between the cow and the lamb. So I grew up with it. That's what I know. And we, we've we always had it around. But as a kid, you just don't have the taste buds that you do when you're an adult, you know, kind of like with wine. You don't like wine when you're in high school, but you start like developing a nicer taste in, high, in, in you know, your older age. And I just realized I said high school for wine and you probably shouldn't be drinking anything in high school, but I was naughty. So anyway, um, but you develop a different kind of taste bud as you get older. So it's now just one of my favorites to have. And it's um, it's definitely definitely cultural. That's for sure. Yeah, that, that that's not I don't know when I ask this question i never know what answer i'll get that's not not one i was prepared for with with liver <laughs> um that's 
<laughs> I don't think I've ever had it. And I, and I know a, a lot of people like, oh, liver, that's just the worst thing ever. That's that's not why I, I'm not against it. I just don't, like you said, culturally, we didn't really mm -hmm. grow up with it. And it's just never been, honestly, something I've even ever thought about. But it, mm -hmm. I, I'm not above it. I absolutely would try it. Yeah. And, and you have to know how to cook it. Like I don't like it without seasoning. I, I definitely like it more well, well done, almost to the point where it's crispy. Um, a lot of salt, pepper. It was, my favorite seasonings on it is just salt, pepper, onion powder, and garlic. And then I sprinkle lemon juice on top of it after it's all done. So that's how I have to have it. And it has to be very seasoned. If it's not seasoned, it's I'm telling you, it's an acquired taste. So <laughs> okay. I, I need all that good stuff on there. But it's it's good. I like it. And I'm sure next season, like in a couple months, I'll be on a different meat. Like I think before this, I loved roast. Like I was constantly mm -hmm. making some roast in my crock pot. I like, just love it. Um, but now I'm just on this liver kick. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll let you know when when I, I'm not going to say if I will at some point, probably after my wife's pregnant, because <laughs> I I can't really even make coffee right now. Um, um, I do have actually I've got my louder with Crowder mug right now, so I, I do nice. have. <laughs> I I do make it, but she's like gagging in the background, so I try to limit my yeah, like anything with the smell. Help. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't imagine. <laughs> wouldn't yeah. imagine at all. Yeah. Stay away from that for a little bit. <laughs> okay so we've kind of uh frequented each other from our uh super secret facebook group that nobody talks about because it's super secret um it's it's so refreshing to run across um conservative counselors because this is what i've talked about with pamela uh, when she was on it's you feel so lonely you feel like mm -hmm. you're the only conservative counselor that it ever existed because it's so we're so left-leaning so incredibly left-leaning in the field that when you run a run across other conservative counselors like yay we're best friends we don't even know each other but but we're best friends now so just tell me a little bit about your kind of experience both becoming a counselor and more being upfront about your your political beliefs and being more of a conservative counselor Okay, so I have a lot to say in this area, um, so bear with me. You good? I, I when I first, so let me kind of back up and just kind of say how I became a counselor because it does pave the way as far as just the place of shock that I was in when I actually became one. And how I became one is I was actually doing Bible studies in uh, the juvie halls and in the jails up in the Bay Area, which everyone now knows as Silicon Valley. I'm now in Orange County in California. Um, and I actually moved down here because of the political climate. And we'll get to that to a, at a different time. But I was in there doing the Bible studies. And one thing that was consistent was that I would always get questions about mental health. I would always get questions about depression, anxiety, even schizophrenia, seeing and hearing things. It was never it was never about Christ. It was never about God. It was help me. How do I get over this issue? And all I was allowed to do as a biblical counselor was take them back to the Gospels. Well, the Gospels weren't necessarily helping a gang member under, understand why he's got so much anxiety. And the anxiety comes from watching his back constantly because he's about to get killed or shot in the jail. So it, it really wasn't a tool that I felt was extremely um, helpful to them. It gave them hope, but it wasn't something that it gave them tools to use at that moment. And every time I tried to help in some way, I always got my hand slapped and kept being told, you're a biblical counselor, you can't go there. Sorry, you're not allowed to talk about mental health. So finally, after can, so can much- Can I stop you just real, yeah. real quick on that? When you talk about hand slap, I'm, I'm just curious, who's, who's slapping the hands there? The chaplain. So there was okay. a, that's who I basically was working under as a volunteer. And the chaplain would either A, hear it from another counselor, because you're always kind of buddied up with another biblical counselor. So the other biblical counselor kind of would go and tattle on me, or um, the jail uh, inmate would 
talk about how awesome it was for the experience to the chaplain with me. And then they would know like, oh, she's talking about things that she's not supposed to. So it was this constant like, hey, so I got to call you in again. I need to tell you not to do this again. So finally, I got fed up. I got sick of it. And I said, okay, well, if it's going to take a piece of paper for me to just be able to help these poor souls, I'm going to go get this piece of paper. And it was basically getting a master's. I had my BA in communications. I had my AA in fashion merchandising and design. Nothing to do with nothing with counseling. Um, (laughs) It was not a career path that I had all thought about. I even when I was in grad school learning about this stuff, I still didn't understand that this is a career that you can do. I didn't get, oh, you can make money doing this. Like I, it just didn't, it didn't register to me. So. Got into grad school, started doing it, and my first, I knew right away that I wanted to go back into the jails, and that's where my first internship, well, back then it's called a traineeship, was with. So it was back in the jails, but this time I was helping them with mental health, and it was just amazing. Now, where I went to grad school is what's important. I went to a seminary grad school. So we learned about God. We learned about Christianity. We had theology classes. Um, divinity classes. I mean, it was, it, I was in the Bible while I was in grad school, which was very important to me because I knew this profession was so science-based and so fleshly based that I wanted God somehow to still be within my scope of work. I didn't want to be a Christian counselor, but I still wanted his presence. I knew I couldn't do it without him. There was just no way. So while I was in there, I'm thinking we're all very like-minded people. We're all God-centered. We all want the same thing. And it was around the time when Obama was running for president and he won. And I was destroyed because I didn't vote for him. So I was just devastated. I couldn't believe it. And I really truly thought that's the same kind of feeling my other classmates had. And one of them, it was actually my professor, was describing about the uh, election night and how it was for her and how she went into tears. And I'm seriously still thinking she's going into tears because she's so sad. And then after she tells me she's been in tears, she turns around and she's like, isn't it the greatest thing that's ever happened to us? And I just was floored. Like, wait, what? You're, you actually voted for him. Hold on. And it, then I started asking other people, did you vote for him? Yeah, of course. We want change. Like, wait, what? Like, I couldn't. It was very strange. Then as you go into the profession, you learn more and more like, oh, my God, there are no conservatives here. Like, no one, no one believes in the same things I do. No one understands things the way I do. And being that I was in Silicon Valley, it was horrible. I mean, I really stood out like a sore thumb. And when Trump won, who I voted for, um, yeah, I, at that point, everyone hated me. At that point, it was like, oh, the therapist that voted for him. Um, it, I really lost a lot of friends that way. I, I lost a lot of respect from people that way. They couldn't believe that I was so smart, but how could I vote for him? They couldn't believe that I was so talented in what I did, but I still voted for him. Um, and it had gotten so bad that I, I literally was getting into depression. And I finally looked at my boyfriend and just said, I, I can't do this anymore. Either we leave or I am going to go into a very deep depression and it's going to be ugly. So we did. We packed up our stuff in six months, moved to Orange County where it's much more conservative. Um, and it's been a blessing ever since. But when that whole Trump thing happened, I guess to answer your second part on how I'm so vocal, I think, I think I've always just been. I think it's just something that I've always carried. I was the kid in school that didn't understand why I had to follow directions. I was the kid that always would push back with the teacher and go, I don't know why you're telling me to do this. I don't get it. I, I, was, I was always the one curious as to why does it have to be done this way? Why can't we do it this way? So it was, it was a personality that I've always had. So it was very natural for me to be kind of loud um, and at times obnoxious about just why are we doing it like this? I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense to me. So it wasn't something I necessarily had to develop. 
But I definitely did have to work at not being feared into a corner because that's really what the left was trying to do was fear us into speaking out because their whole purpose was to shut us conservative therapists up because we don't belong. We're not ethical. We're bad. We're going to indoctrinate. We're going to be the ones to indoctrinate. How hilarious is that? These poor (laughs) souls that need help. Um, So thank God I had that personality, but it was definitely work to not be feared into this little corner, that's for sure. Um, And just quickly, the group that's very highly secretive, there's a reason for it. It's because our members, these poor things, we, when it first started, it was started by Kristen Hawker. She's amazing. I love her. She is our admin, like superior. And then there's two others. There's me and then there's Bernard. And so we, she started it and what she did was kind of have a few people that were already in there and would go out into the other therapist groups and look for people like myself who would make conservative comments and kind of go, hey, just so you know, I know you're getting bashed. I know you feel this way. There's a group over here if you want to come and join us. That's kind of how we found the group. And the reason why we did that is because some leftists did get into that group, screenshot a lot of our stuff and then go to our employees and get some of our members fired. So again, that's why it's so serious. I wish it wasn't. I wish we can be like, hey, look at us. This is where we are and look how big we are and how awesome we are. But it's to protect the members. They're so afraid. And as you know, a lot of them don't use their names like you and I do. A lot of them um, have these really odd pseudo names and it's because they're so freaked out to speak out. So yeah. No, and and, I, and I'll say on my end of being a member uh, of this group, that's that is reassuring to know mm-hmm. that that level of care is being put into it. Mm-hmm. I think for me, and I think for everybody else, like the the ones that have pseudonames, know that you guys are doing a great job. But it's not perfect. We we can't give a hundred percent. Hey, nothing bad will ever happen, just because there's some crazy people out there that do do bad things and that's something on my end um just to kind of share a little bit of of my story of how this podcast my practice everything came about i i would say i've always been like i was born and raised here in in duncan oklahoma we are pretty rural have about 23, 24,000 people, and we're the biggest city in the county, and it's Oklahoma, so we are ruby, ruby red. Um, just it, it, we, if we have an election and you have a D by your name, you, you already lost. Like that's just the way it way it works down here. But even here, um, me working at that local hospital I talked about where I was born and my children were born, um, I ended up losing my job because of the vaccine shot in Oklahoma. Again, Ruby red Oklahoma. And that was just such a, a jarring moment because I had been, I had been pretty over the last, particularly since being married, I've been a lot more involved in politic discussions and everything where I was a little bit more just passive, I guess, previously. Um, But so I was a little bit more active, but I never thought about anything like that ever affecting me personally. Uh, and when the president of the United States personally caused my job to be be gone, uh, that changed me pretty significantly. Um, the one somewhat regret that I have on that, um, and and I guess technically saying losing my job is it's technically not true because I did technically resign, which I was completely against doing. I was, Mm -hmm. and and to put in perspective of how close this was, my wife and I were talking about this last night. It was the healthcare worker uh, vaccine mandate that I was up for, not the OSHA one. Um, the, The OSHA one, people like, oh, that got overturned. You're good. No, the healthcare one, to my knowledge, is still going on, too, as, as far as I know. Uh, it was in place, and it was like, this was like a Wednesday, and that next Monday, it was going to be in effect. I was without a job that Monday. 
and the courts did put a stay on it. It was either that Wednesday or Thursday. Um, so during that time, I did get to keep my job for like another couple of weeks, but the writing was on the wall. It's like, if the Supreme Court upholds this, which they did, then I'm without a job. I cannot do this to my family to just sit here and wait to be fired without any backup plan. I, I, I got to do something. And in that time that my current uh, full-time job, which is uh, telehealth, working from home, um, I was able to get that in the meantime. They gave me a good offer, and I couldn't just sit and wait for me to be fired, even though I really wanted to. I really wanted to be fired to have that kind of ammo in the back because I would not be afraid to be a little litigious about something like that because it was wrong. But technically, I did resign. So I really don't have a legal case, but I do have an emotional case that mm -hmm. that moment, like I will never, I will never have that type of innocence that. Because I've never been fired before. I've always been a good worker. I've I've always done my job really well. I get good reviews. And to just have such a violation to take my livelihood away because of a medical decision, that'll change you. That, that'll change you pretty quick. And that has emboldened me to be like, I'm not going to continue to wait for the next disaster to happen to say anything because that's too late. So that's kind of the precipice of me making my own business is if I'm on my own, forget you, forget you federal government. You, you don't touch me here. This is mine. So go away. So that that's kind of my uh, transition into being more vocally conservative anyways. Right. Right. And good for you. I mean, it, sometimes it does take what's happening in the world to happen at our front door for us to kind of just step back and go, wait a minute. It's, this can happen to me. No, screw this. Yes. We're I'm getting now I'm mad. Like this, now we're right. going to do something about it. And and that may happen more and more to our members in our group and it does. I mean, we have one as I'm sure you've seen whose license is on the line right now. And yeah. and she's, you know, she's kind of in this place of like what the heck, man? How is this even happening to me? And yeah. it's it's all again, not because we've caused harm to a client, not because we've caused some kind of issue in a family trauma or, or some kind of family system, not because we did something unethical to one of our clients, but because a fellow therapist doesn't like that we're conservative. That is yeah. why we're getting fired. And that is why our licenses are even being questioned right now. That's sad. It's yes. heartbreaking. It, yes, it, it is. And I, I guess that's something on my end of things. It's part of why I'm actually doing the podcast for one is just ex exposure and almost kind of a green light to other conservative counselors and not even just counselors, but just people, professionals to like, no, like we need that. We are out here. Here's this green light. We can talk about these things, but there is that real world example there. Like, like you're talking about with that fellow member and uh, all sorts of countless other examples that there is a real world cost that even if this individual is able to keep their license, just the emotional cost that, that, there's a lot that goes into that when someone's threatening your livelihood. So I do think it's pretty prudent to be thinking about the potential cost of speaking out and being prepared. So what would you say because for conservative counselors or doctors or whoever, um, that that's going to be a little bit more open. How do you think they should prepare for the potential cost and what type of backup plans or, or, or anything would you suggest for them? So one thing that we I've started to do with our group is have monthly meetings because of specifically this question. How can how can I how can I be an advocate for conservatism if I'm going to maybe lose my livelihood? And so since that was such a big topic for so many of us, I said, well, let's meet because I have all kinds of ideas that you can do. And so do other people. And so we've 
developed this group where we just once a month hang out and basically talk about the different streams of income you can have. Therapy does not have to be our sole income provider. It could be one of them. But my big thing is have other streams, whether it's going to be like what I do. I do multi-level marketing. I love it. I enjoy it. It's part of my holistic stuff. So I love doing that. That's my other stream of income. Or if you want, if you're if you're creative, start creating. I know somebody who does jewelry on the side and sells that on Etsy to make some other form of income, but just some others investment, purchase some investment properties, rent them out, Airbnb them, do whatever you got to do. Don't fully count on your therapy. And the thing with therapy is too, you have to be healthy. You have to, you have to show up. You don't get to do therapy on the side somehow. Like it depends on you to actually physically be present with somebody else to provide therapy. God forbid something were to happen to me that I can't. I can't talk. I can't move. I can't see. Yet, well, something happens to me. If I'm sick for some time, I mean, I'm sure you know when we get sick, we hate it. It's like, oh, my God, if I don't work, I don't make money. Like, I right. can't not work. This is impossible. So just that alone, think about those fears. Think about the time that your city seriously sitting there thinking about, I have the flu. And if I don't show up tomorrow for my 10 folks, I don't get money. I, I don't, that's not an option. I need to get well and, and just capture that fear and say, okay, if this is my reality, what can I do to ease this fear? What other income can I find? A lot of folks will sit there and say, well, I don't have to worry about the fact of, about me being vocal because I'm a conservative. So I don't ever do that. So I don't have to worry about my livelihood ever being in trouble. Well, no, that's not true because you may not make it the next day because of some ailment, some issue, some problem. And so it doesn't have to do with the fact that you're going to be vocal or not in your political views. It could just be that you're just not going to be able to provide because you have 104 temperature. So because of that, let's figure something else out for you. Go find out some other ways where you can provide for yourself, for your family, where you're just not totally dependent on the fact that you have to be a hundred. In our case, I always say we don't even have to be a hundred percent. We have to be 120% present for our clients. We don't get to just be baseline. We have to be above baseline. And to depend on that every single time that you have to work, every day that you have to be present is exhausting. So let's look at other means of getting income. Let's figure that out and spend more time there than we actually do. Because I don't think people actually think about it. And, and I think that that's a mistake. I think you really should think about how you can make some other money some other way. I, I and, am and in, passive money. I, I'm in 100% agreement. Um, that's something that this, particularly this past situation really taught me that especially in an employee employee type of position i don't have that level of trust anymore that hey i can just sit here and i'm going to retire here and and i'll i'll tell you my previous job that was my plan i was very happy there i was planning on retiring there and again that that naivety really wore off real quick um when they say you get this shot or, or, you, or you're fired that that's just a just a reality. So, some things that I've been doing, um, I, I haven't really told too many people this yet. My we, my wife and I, we we're increasingly uh, becoming like we want to get out, get away a little bit. And I already said we're we're a pretty rural community, especially compared to people that that live in a city. But we we bought some property that's a little bit out of town. Um, got just shy of thirteen acres, and we are planning on building out there. Um, we're waiting for building costs to not be astronomically high, so I don't know how long we'll be waiting. But um, when we do, we're planning on instead of just selling this house and putting that into our new house, we're keeping this one, in part because we refinanced here when it was like. 2.8% or something ridiculously low. So we're going to rent this house out. And that is going to be hopefully the start of a new, not just for this house, but really a new career in general on the side of 
once this house really gets going, going out and getting another one and another one. Um, and that way, if something does, like you're saying, if I something terrible happens to me, I can't work. I already have something going there. Like, right. well, I'll never be able to be 100% independent and never have to worry about anything. But let's do a little bit of homework and not put ourselves in, in these awful positions. Smart. Good for you. That's exciting. And I love hearing that. And that's exactly what should, everyone should do. And it doesn't have to be what I'm doing or what you're doing. It's just like you said, it's going to take a little homework for you to figure out what you're comfortable with. What is it that you, what have you, what have you desired that you've wanted to do other than therapy? What do you look at yeah. in other people and admire and say, I like that. Go get it. Go do it. Go figure it out. Do yeah. some homework, write a book, do some stuff, you know? Um, and if that, if I can do anything, it's the, the one thing that I hope that I can be is encouraging for people. Mm -hmm. I want you to succeed. I want you to have the life you've desired, you, the one that you deserve. I want, I want you to have the blessings of your heart. And, and if I can help push that in some way, I 100% will. So let's yeah. go get it done. Let's do it. And that's really what I, in the short time I've kind of interacted with you and seen some of your posts and everything, that's what I appreciate because you, you'll notice, and, and for anyone listening or watching this through my previous episodes and in general, I'm going to be way more critical on conservatives than on liberals. And that's because... I am more conservative and I, I have a lot of people that I know and love that are. And it's such a low hanging fruit to like, Oh, did you see what that liberal said today? They're crazy. Like, don't get me wrong. There's times where that it, it can be humorous, but if you stay there and then even worse, you stay in the, Oh my gosh, they're out to get us. All these bad things are happening. Again, it's one thing to be cognizant of that. Yeah. You should know what's going on. But don't just stay there. Like, wh what's the purpose of just staying in this frightened, the world's out to get me, I, I just need to get into my bomb shelter and never leave? That, that's not mm -hmm. living. That There's no, like you're saying, depression in, in your own life. Why shouldn't you just be super depressed and just not try to do anything in life if you have that mentality? So recognize the hardships, yes, but then do something. Make something new. Do do something. Create a new network. I mean, there's there's ideas. We got to be creative, and I think that creative part for conservatives has really been lacking. And I think we're starting to see a a bit of a new turn of more creativity, more arts, more music. Just l using things that we've kind of ceded to the left for so many years. Like, let's do it ourselves. There's nothing stopping us. Johnny, one hundred percent. I couldn't agree with you more. Like, what is stopping us? And we're so quick to look at the left and talk about, oh, my God, they have such this victimhood mentality. You know, they just always just want to sit there and be victims of their situation and circumstances. And it's like, well, what are, what are we doing? What are we doing sitting here complaining about, oh, the left is hurting us? And it's like, OK, well, what are you doing about it? Are we going to just sit here and continue to just you know, say stuff on our group and then just go about your day the next day? Or are you going to be like, I'm tired of saying the same thing. I'm tired of typing the same words. This keyboard warrior in me is, is really boring now. So let me actually go do something. And you're right. Be creative. Why are we not more creative? Why? Who said the left gets to rule that side of the industry? Heck no. Let's take that back. We have some really creative conservatives. We just are a little more practical. We're a little more realistic. We we have a mindset of um, of economics and finance. So our, our whole thing is, well, what's What's feasible with my with my money? Uh, sure, we, we we have those parameters, but that's just called being smart. It doesn't mean just because I'm smart, I can't be creative. Who said yes. that? 
Go be creative too and smart. Holy smokes, that's ruling the world right there. So how can I cultivate this energy in you to get you to use all those gifts that are sitting inside of you dormant so that you can actually go be something for yourself and for the people in your life around you? I want to help you do that. You want to do that, Johnny. You, I can tell you that's what you want to do with doing this podcast. That's what you're doing is you're helping people feel this fire inside of them so that they actually go and do something. So there's not only three of us conservative therapists doing it for them. Like, let's yeah. let's go, people. Let's get this done. This is, It's fun. I don't know about you. I have fun encouraging other people. Absolutely. Um, this is... This will be when when you air, I think it will be the sixth episode, five or six. I'm not sure. The We've got another one in the queue. But regardless, it's not been very long. Um, and, and this, my thought of the of my practice, I, I became uh, LLC, I believe, the beginning of October. So that's still pretty new. But the idea of the podcast really just kind of kind of just happened. I'd done a couple videos on YouTube. Um, I was like, I really like the podcast type of form, a little bit just more kind of bearing your heart out there, not quite as much editing, just just throwing it out there. And that's just been since like January. I mean, it's not been very long at all. And I don't say this to like say, wow, look at all this success I've had because it's not like I've had thousands of views or whatever. But I'll tell you, in this short amount of time, I've had a somebody that I'm actually – planning on interviewing here pretty soon that's a that's a college student that's had a reached out to me randomly out of nowhere um to it's like hey what do you think i should do here i've had just yesterday met this guy for for coffee is like hey i listened to your podcast it was so refreshing um had people like you pamela i've never met her before i've not been doing this for two months and there's all these connections already so to your point go make a podcast. If you're an artist, go make some art. Like there's people out there that want it. You just have to, you just have to do it. It's really not that complicated. Right. Right. And, and, and really, I think sometimes what happens is, and I understand this, people get stuck. They kind of just don't know where to go. How do I start? Where do I, where do I look? Where do I start an LLC? How do I do all this? And it's, and, I am fine with anyone, whether conservative or not. I I have run businesses. I have lost businesses. I have been an employee of places. I, I It's not that I know everything. I certainly do not. But I do know a fair share of things. Come and ask me, how did you get your S-Corp going? Is an S-Corp better than an LSC? Should I just do sole proprietor? How do you start selling on the internet? How do I get a website going? How do I market myself? Ask questions. If not to me, ask online. There's so yes. many people you can just go on Twitter and at them and say, how did you do this? Most times people are very comfortable talking about how awesome they are. So they'll be happy to say, well, this is how I did it. They like sharing yeah. it. They want to talk about it. So just ask. I, it's this like crippling thing that we just talked about. People get so crippled, they get stuck. It's like, why are you stuck? How did you get so stuck over one little thing of, well, I don't know how to get started. How did I get you so stuck? Ask a question. How did you start? Where do I go? I'll tell you right now, best place to go. I did it simple, fast in two seconds. LegalZoom. That's how I created my business. Just went to LegalZoom and just answered a bunch of questions. Ta-da. I had an escort. Done. Very, very simple. It's not as complicated as, as people think. You're absolutely right about that. And you know, some of the stuff that you've been saying, and I shared this in the group a little while ago, and um, kind of by the behind the scenes, I'm doing, uh, uh, I, I got a guinea pig here, something that I'm eventually going to add um, to to my practice is just more of a, of a consulting angle. And my idea of this is, yes, for other conservative counselors, I would love to have more conservative counselors get off to a good start and everything. So I want to focus on that, but more broad. I've got, I'm a part of a couple city councils, or not city councils, uh, chamber of commerces, and one in my local town. Again, Duncan, we are, it's kind of a, just a, 
you, you hear by word of mouth type of community. There's people that have been in this community. Their their grandparents were was the mayor here or whatever. And it's it's just kind of that we're about like 10 years behind on most technological things, which is fine. It's actually part of what I really like about it here is it, it's a little bit slower. But goodness, I was trying to find an accountant in town. It's like there's not a single website. Like, does nobody have a website in our town? And I'm sitting here thinking like, okay, for my parents' generations, that's fine. Like they, they oh, you go talk to so-and-so and they've got that. But for our generation, my generation down below, that's not going to work for much longer. At some point, you're going to have to adapt. And I'm sitting here thinking like I'm really not trying to be overly braggardly, but I'm pretty sure I've got the most functional website in town and what would stop me from t- t- from helping the boutique that that's in town from helping them with their website nothing like I, I don't have to just provide counseling right just like we talked about so this is not fleshed out at all and to your point too it might fail it might not go anywhere but it's a good idea why don't I see if it's got some got some wings to it, test it out, and we'll see where it goes. But there's that creative spirit. I'm not an artist, but I have that level of creativity, kind of a business type of creativity. Test it out. Right. If it fails, I'll let you know, and I'll tell you my failures so you don't have to. But it's fun. Like you said, that's a fun thing to do, to try new things. Yes. And it's not only that you have creativity, but you have curiosity. You have this, this desire to know more, like what's, what's behind curtain number two? Like, I want to see what's there. And that helps. That's, that's actually a gift. Not a lot of people have curiosity. It's a, you know, some people do have to develop that gift, but I look at it as a gift if you have it, because you're just constantly like, what's next? What else can I do? That's, that if you can use that gift to somehow empower others, please do, please do. And I know that's what you're doing through here for sure. But you're also saying they're going, well, I have other talents. So let me go and give them some kind of help outside of my podcast and see what happens. Awesome. Awesome. I wish more of us conservatives would do that. It's, it's yes. sometimes frustrating. That That's something I was sharing with Pamela that again, the, the, the the tribalism that's happened, I know it's always been here, but definitely post Obama um, and and certainly post Trump, that the tribalism is super super strong now. Mm-hmm. It's my team, your team, and because our team lost the election, whether you think it was stolen or not, we lost the election. Therefore, their team's winning. So these four years have to be terrible. And while, yes, I just made that kind of mention of I'm not able to build my house just yet because of the prices and inflation. And I have, I, I'm really trying not to be hyperbolic, but I, I have very little to know things that I have to uh, say nicely about the current administration. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not happy about it. But, and it's had effects. But I look back in, in my personal life, like, my fa- like my family is growing during the Biden pres- presidency. I am starting this business. I've made all these new connections. There's a lot of great things going on in my life. I'm not letting Biden dictate my happiness. That's silly. Like no nobody should let that happen. Amen to that. Absolutely. We don't get to give up. That's not an option. I and I tell my clients that all the time. You don't get to give up. It's not an option. You, you get to keep going. That's what you get to keep doing. So so what are we going to do next? Even if you're going to get up and just breathe the next day and put a smile on your face. Okay, perfect. We'll, we'll start there. We'll start small, but you don't get to just give up. It's it, yeah. get that out of your head. I kind of say that with like when people get married, it's like, okay, when you get married, you don't get to get divorced. It's not an option. So don't go into the marriage thinking that's an option. No, it's not. Mm. You don't get to give up. You have to keep going. Yeah. And gosh, I'm I'm really going to butcher this because I can't even remember where I saw it. But somewhere on Twitter yesterday, I saw something about resiliency and how our current form of just devastation. And again, on the right, 
we we are just as bad, if not worse. Devastated because Trump lost. Oh, it's it's all over. That's not resiliency, and that's not it's not doing anybody any good by just being dejected all the time. Like, if your life sucks right now, what can you do about it? Um, mm-hmm. it we we just we need to get back to that resilient mindset and. I'm going to do it no matter what. Like you said, it's not an option to give up. Right, right, right. And it's so funny. I, my, I keep wanting to say my boyfriend, he's going to kill me. He's my fiance now. He proposed to me, so I have to make sure I change that wording. Sorry. So yeah, my, you don't want to get in trouble. I, I feel so bad. So he had showed me a video um, this morning about somebody who – okay, caveat. I – I am a rabbit hole junkie. I love going down rabbit holes. I have fun doing it. It's 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 very intriguing and interesting for me. I, I love it. That's just my thing. However, kind of like what you were just talking about, there's, there's this level of like, this is fun. I'm learning. I'm definitely educating myself, but I can't get stuck in it. And so she showed me this video where this guy was saying, oh, I know that Trump is going to be president again now because they it's already been ruled that the 2020 election was um, uh, rigged. And so the, the Supreme Court has already overturned it and the Supreme Court people are in hiding because they're going to make the announcement. And so just get ready. Trump is coming. And I'm saying, I'm going, how does how does that help us? How does that help anybody right now? These people who are stuck in this whole 2020 was a fraud. And, I, and I'm and i one of those people. I think it was rigged. I totally do believe that the Democrats were like, we're not losing this again. We got to do what we got to do. We're not, we're not going to count on our people. Sure, there was a level of rigging done. Sure, not a huge plan. No, but I think there is just some voter fraud that happened, which happens all the time, all the time with the right as well. So I understand that, but I can't get stuck in it and go, well, I just quit. I quit until everything is corrected. Until things are corrected, I am just not going to do this anymore. It's like, no, no, you, not only do I not want to constantly sit there and perpetuate this kind of narrative where we lost and shame on us, but I want people to get out of that. I want people, like you said, even though we're in the Biden administration, there is not anything I can say good about it. I certainly don't look at my own life and say it's doomed just as much as the administration is. No, my life, just like yours, is thriving. And why? Because we made a choice. We made a decision. We have a certain mindset. We decided that, yes, this is going on. This is horrible. I'm going to do what I can to help educate and inform all the masses. I will. I will do my part. But at the same time, I have to be healthy enough to do that. And if I'm going to be stuck in a mindset where I hate the world, I hate people, and everyone owes me something, I will not be able to be used as a tool in any which way to help this world. So what do I do right now, right here for me and my life and my family to make it thrive? And we've, we've got to seriously change that mindset as conservatives. We've got to thrive and get creative, like we said. A- absolutely. Absolutely. Now, k- kind of just taking it backwards, even before you were uh, before you were a counselor, would you say you've always been right-leaning? Did you have a moment where you kind of had an epiphany, a red pill, so, so to speak? Or just kind of tell me your own personal political journey. So... My voting years, I've always voted right. I've always been a conservative. So, And I didn't actually become a citizen of this country until I was about 20, I think it was 25 or 26, something like that. So it was later. I was born in Iran. So I came here when I was maybe two. Um, my, my parents and I got here. Uh, we got our green cards. We did everything legally. Um, and then we got so when they got their green card they applied for their citizenship and when they got their citizenship i had already turned 18. so i had to then do it on my own i had to apply for my citizenship on my own i finally didn't got set up uh, became a citizen now how i was a conservative was it's interesting i i've always gone to catholic schools um i was raised in the church I, I got baptized on my own as a Christian in my 20s. Um, I always had kind of the, the I don't, I guess, 
I don't want to say I, I took on or adapted to the theology of uh, Catholicism because I didn't. I, I just heard the Bible. I didn't actually receive it and meditate on it. It was just like, oh, God, the, the priest is talking again. It was more of this nuisance that's happening here. But it was just always there and subliminal, I guess. And so I kind of was able to kind of hear and see that side, the more conservative side and understand it because I lived in it. But my mom, I mean, she's voted Democrat her whole life until Trump. So it was, you know, I had the, the, the idea of conservatism, but I had a home base that was more liberal-ish. Um, but values, if, if you look at Persian values, they're very much based on conservative values, kind of like what they're talking about in mainstream right now, how all these... Um, a lot of Mexicans or Latins, uh, Latinos and Latinas are getting upset about the whole Latin X situation and being married out of wedlock. And they're like, wait, that's not even our culture. That's not even what we believe in. We're a very conservative culture. And that's what Iranians are, a very conservative culture. Um, but when they come here, so just briefly, a little history, when they leave Iran, when they have left Iran, it's usually to escape the Islamic Republic of Iran. So when they come here and they hear democracy or Democrat, they assume that, oh, that's what I'm going to vote for because I don't want to be the Republic of Iran. Mm -hmm. So that's why they kind of shy away from being a Republican until they start going like, wait a minute, what did I just vote for? Like men can be women, women can be men. Hold on a second. That's not what I thought it was. So then they have this like this problem with their values and what they're doing and, and this, this, um, inconsistency in their behaviors and beliefs. Um, but that's that's generally how Persians are. They are more conservative. My father was, uh, or excuse me, is he has not passed away yet, thank God. He worked hard. He had nothing. We had zero dollars when we came here. And he worked his way up. And I remember there was times where he would say something about taxes. And I would always sit there and go, I don't get it. Why does daddy have to pay all these taxes? Why does all that money get taken away from him? It didn't make sense to me. So that was there a little bit. Then affirmative action happened when I was about in high school, maybe right after high school. And I had a black friend who happened to be gay as well. And he loved it. He thought it was great. And I was like, well, wait a minute. How come you get privilege and I don't? How come you're you're going to be able to get into that college. But I can't, I wasn't even born here. Should an affirmative action benefit me? Like it just didn't make sense. Little things like that. Where I was like, this doesn't make sense. And then when Obama started coming in, I couldn't understand how people couldn't see socialism. I didn't get how people couldn't look at Obama and say, that's what socialism is. That it, that is exactly what this man is doing to our country. And I guess because we're not taught it, I didn't know socialism in school. They didn't talk to us about communists in school. Like we didn't, I didn't understand. Um, so I think just a lack of knowledge, a lot of people vote Democrat. And as you get older, you learn. So then you start voting more conservative as you get older, which happens often. Um, but I've always been a conservative voter. I've always had conservative values. I never really agreed with Democrats. I'm actually an independent. I, I don't I don't call myself a Republican because I'm willing to vote Democrat if someone good shows up. I think Robert um, Kennedy Jr. is thinking about running um, and he's a Democrat. I would totally vote for him. I like his values. I like his beliefs. I think he's great. I'm not 100% sure. I just need to dig down on his policies more to understand. But he's so far very much in line with like Ron Paul or Rand Paul, which I really, really mm -hmm. like. Um, and I am, I feel I am more libertarian than I am a conservative Republican. Um, I like to let people decide for themselves. I, I like to not have government involved in anyone's life. Um, I still feel like Republicans still like to be regulatories around us and I don't want to be regulated. Um, so that's generally why I don't call myself a Republican or ever said you know, yes to a Republican. Actually, let me take that back. My earlier years, I did mark Republican and I immediately pulled back and said, no, I'm an independent. But yeah, I've, I've always had it. I've never had like moments of like, what did I do? What did I vote yeah. for? I, I thank God I didn't have that. No. Yeah. How about you? I'm that, curious. That, that have is... you always been conservative? Well, so I, I, I'm thinking back when I was, so when, 
sorry to kind of back up a little bit more. When when did you come to the country? It was 1979 or 78, excuse okay. me, 1978, right before the um, revolution in Iran. The revolution in Iran okay. happened in 79. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, you've been here, you know, a good, good chunk of time. So you, you'd certainly have a, uh, an understanding of, of the culture and everything, but obviously it is different when it's your, your complete home. You know, I've I said, I'm, I live in the same town that I was born in. I, I did live elsewhere for a few years, but this is my home. Like I, it's, it's pretty much all I've ever known. And like I said, we're 70 plus Republican and, and most races and everything. So pretty much everybody that grows up here and, and instead, uh, unless you're, you know, kind of rebelling in high school or whatever, even still, you, you didn't see growing up, which we can get into this in just a little bit, but you didn't see all the like far left protest stuff in high school. Um, sure, you had little things, and, and you know people would go smoke dope or something, but um, it it wasn't a it wasn't like most college campuses that I that I've experienced where it's just indoctrination. Um, growing up, it just wasn't really that way. Uh, I, in fact, I didn't really even think about politics much at all, which. I wish that was still kind of that way. I wish kids had a little bit more innocence, but that's that's right. a different question here. Um, so all that being said, my first experience I had with any uh, politics at all was during the uh, 2000 Gore-Bush election, which was famous for the recount in Florida and that whole thing. I wasn't old enough to vote then, but our elementary school had some like like a mock voting Thing of sorts and i remember they had like these uh election signs up and it wasn't a uh this is who you need to vote for it was just like a civics class type of type of environment so i remember that growing up and i remember going for bush just because i knew my parents voted for him so mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah i'll go for the guy my parents voted for and my first presidential election was the uh, the obama mccain one and i distinctly remember voting for McCain but I remember voting for him just like he's got the R so that's the one we vote for like that was <laughs> I, I was 18 and wasn't very educated on it um I went after 18 to honestly about age let's see I got married when I was 27 so really about that time we're looking at eight nine ten years I would say I was conservative at worst. Um, maybe say I was independent. Never said I was a liberal. I know that for certain. But I think the best way to describe it was apathetic, especially mm -hmm. during the Obama years. It's like I just there was so much division and I just wanted to I was in college. Like, I just want to do my studies. Like, leave me alone. Um, so. I just didn't really think about it. And I, I was of the mindset that like all politicians are evil. So why should I care? And I still hold that to a degree. Don't get me wrong. But I also see now that there is some more nuance, um, especially when I see things now like uh, drag queen story hour, for instance, there's, there's only one side that's pushing that. I mean, We've already railed on some conservatives, uh, conservatism type of uh, issues that we have, but I don't see any politicians saying, yeah, that's a good idea on the right. Mm -hmm. Just don't see it. It's everywhere on the left. So during that Trump, I didn't vote for Trump in 16, actually. I voted for uh, Gary Johnson, and I did it just as a forget you Trump, forget you Hillary. Uh, I was still in my I hate everyone type of phase, but I wanted to vote. So I voted for the Libertarian. Right, and, that's a bad thing. Good job. And I didn't really even look at what he stood for. Um, I've kind of looked back afterwards, and I don't think he was really all that reasoned. Um, he mm -hmm. just wasn't either of them. So I, I, I didn't vote for Trump. Um, but that all changed. And this is the craziest thing for me now. Um, my moment that got me involved in more political discussion was 
do you remember in it would have been i believe early 2017 when uh milo yiannopoulos went to cal berkeley and they antifa protested him yes. do you remember that by any chance yes, yes i do yeah. yes yes so they went crazy on him they yes. did and yes. i i had known who milo was i Again, I was still pretty apathetic. I didn't really get much into it. And especially now, like, I, I think he's just kind of a, almost kind of a character. I don't even know who he really Have is. Have you heard what's happened to him? He's done this total 180 now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So okay. it, it was not because, and I guess that's just to further emphasize my point. It was not because like, how dare they do that to Milo? Like, I didn't care about him. But what they did was so blatantly wrong. It's like, mm -hmm. here is this gay man trying to give this speech, and you're literally burning buildings. And it wasn't even that that changed my mind. It's that that was swept under the rug. It's like, right. this wasn't some hearsay. We have video all over the place of this, and nobody in the mainstream media is going to call this out and say, this is terrorism? Like, it's... It's as about as terroristic as it can get. And I know this was later down in the, the 2020 debates, but still, it's Antifa's still just an idea. That's not a real group. Like, what are you talking about? They're right. burning buildings down. That's I I live in Oklahoma. We know domestic terrorism pretty well here. We had the Oklahoma City bombing. Like I I know I know what domestic terrorism is, and that's that's it. <laughs> just mm -hmm. all it all it would have taken for me is somebody at ABC News or wh wherever CNN say, "Hey, I don't care where you are politically, we can't do this." That's all I was looking for, and right. it still hasn't come. It's like, what? We're just gonna say that's okay, and it just got worse from there. Um, Antifa became they they almost in many people's eyes became the moral choice here. No, you can't. You can't have that and have a civilized society. So that was really my precipice to realize. Okay, I may not agree with a lot of antics of uh, of Trump at that time, especially, but these social issues are just rotting away our our country. And once I got married, particularly, then. I've always been a uh, pretty nonchalant, um, easygoing. I've never been in a fist fight, not had too many enemies in my life. But when I got married and really when we were dating, this inner protection part of me came out. And it's like, especially during BLM and everything, it's like, what if my wife was there? It's like, that just drove me insane. And because I know there was other wives that were there, there were other children that were affected by these. Like, I can't just sit around and expect these things to go away and act like it won't happen here. So more and more of these social is really the social things, not so much Hillary or even Obama. Um, it's the social things that they have helped push underneath that. That's what really pushed not so much me to become conservative, but to just be more outspoken about it and to realize that hey like i need to actually start voting in a lot of these local elections city boards and all all of that stuff that's really what awoken it was just these awful social movements going on right and you along with a whole bunch of other people right now i mean so yes. many people are waking up i mean like you said pamela who was a she was a staunch Democrat. She, that's what she believed in. And here she is going, I am actually a conservative, probably more so than my husband now. I mean, yeah. people switch and they're doing a lot of it in these past two years for sure. Yeah. And yeah. that's, that's kind of the big drum I've been beating here for, again, particularly for Oklahoma. And I talked about this with Pamela, California. I mean, you're, you're well aware of this, that it's, it's a lot easier to pick out the conservatives in a very liberal area. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's got to stick, stick out like a sore thumb. Whereas here it's just very cultural. Like mm -hmm. you stick out like a 
sore thumb if if you're the drag queen story hour here like that just it's not like it can't happen here but it's not as common so because of that i think there is a lot more laxness particularly in the schools here oh no they wouldn't teach crt and duncan no 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 mm -hmm. turns out they do i've looked at some of the teachers and some of the things they say yes it's here and it's probably more dangerous here because you have no idea that that it's going on and you assume you can just push them to the schools and they won't hear anything no they will so that's where i'm really trying to wake up some more of the conservative areas that these ideas you think that would never happen here not just they can happen here they are here they're in fact um my parents neighbors across the street they just pulled their kids out of uh out of an elementary school that the nicest elementary school in town mind you and the, in second grade, they had a non-binary non classmate. And the dad was like, no, we're, we're just, we're not Good. doing it. I'm Good not. For him. Good for him. Yes. Good for and, him. And what's great about this too, like, again, this guy's a dentist. They had no plan. This was not a, oh, we'll do it at the end of the school year. It's no right now. So they set up a little a school room in his dentist office and they just like set up their own little school. They'll come up with something better next year, but he's like, no, we're, we'll figure it out, but we're getting out. I, I, I was so encouraged hearing that story about him. Amazing. And that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping people will start doing. It's I put a lot of comments and thoughts in my, social media, and especially in Instagram, I'm very much on, uh, you know, constantly on uh, stories and talking and sharing my thoughts. And I have a lot of people who follow me that are not conservative. Um, mm -hmm. And especially because of this MLM that I'm a part of, there's a lot of people who are just my my good friends from there that that I know are not conservative. And so they'll ask me questions like, well, what is, what is this that's going on? Like they don't know about the drag queen story time. And that concerns me so much. There is a level of, okay, I'm just not involved in politics. I don't want to be, it's too stressful. So I live in my little bubble and that's okay. I get it. I understand why you do, do that. You're comfortable and the, the stuff that you might learn is gross and disgusting and might burn your eyes. I get that. But if you don't, what you just described is what's going to happen. Little, good, small, red conservative towns are going to have that first binary, whatever the heck they're called, in their non-binary, sorry, school. And all because everyone decided, oh, it's over there. It's not a problem. It's happening yep. in California. They're crazy anyway. Well, guess what? Oklahoma is one of the states that Californians are really drawn to right now. Yeah. You guys have a we lot have of We have some money. in our neighborhood right now. Yep. I'm telling you, they're coming. And when they come, they don't stop voting blue. They still vote the crazy. They will start voting the crazy over there. So please, I mean, if there's anything I can say to the folks that are just kind of like, well, none of this matters to me. None of this. I'm not a conservative therapist. I'm not even a conservative. It's like, no, it matters to you when it's at your front door. It's almost too late. So please yes. be informed. Please listen as much as it might pain you. Just at least be informed. I'm not saying to go out there and be the activist. I'm just saying educate yourself on what's the norm right now in other states. California, New York, D.C., and Florida tend to be the states that kind of uh, project what's going to come. They are the ones that are going to kind of, they're, they're, they're the jet setters of the political climate. That's that's just the states that do it for us, the, for the rest of the country. It trickles slowly, but it ends up showing up at your front door. So please watch what's happening over here. Be very frightened because it, def especially since Newsom is, is gearing up for presidency. I mean, that has always been the mission. He has always wanted the presidency. He is, he is, I have zero nice things to say about this man. Zero. So I will contain myself as much as I can, but he <laughs> is just, he is poison. You guys think Hillary's poison? Wait mm -hmm. until Newsom. Wait until Newsom. And I am very frightened for our country for the day when he is a president because it will happen. And sadly, it will happen. You know, I 
I, I he's actually a guy that I try to limit my exposure to because I I, I try I try not to go into this realm too much, but I'm hard pressed to say that you can look look at him in his eyes when he's talking and not see some type of like demonic spirit or something. It's it's really the it's eerie. Like I even What's see that? horns, like when he yeah. when he talks. I'm it's, like, oh God, you can see them coming out of him almost. It's it's horrible. It's eerie. It's yes. really really scary. It is. Uh, now, kind of we're we're on the non-binary, and that's the you know that's that's the big talking point right now is really all the the gender ideology, non-binary, transgender, all of that stuff, which. You know, our obviously our profession is wrapped up right in the middle of it. How much of that issue? Now, let me, you know, I've talked about this with other guests. Let, let me approach it from this angle. With your practice, um, your individual practice, how do you line yourself up with that? Prepare for that? Speak out about it? Like. What's your regimen to counteract this gender nonsense that that we're encountering right now? Well, you know, I've been blessed because I have been very vocal about my beliefs and values um, for a number of years now. I don't get a lot of folks reaching out to me for therapy who tend to be in that I don't know, group, population, the LGBTQ plus whatever population. Um, it, it's known that that I, first of all, I just don't specialize in it. I, and I, I think it does need a specialty. Um, and, and it's because also I think they know that they're going to kind of hit a wall. They're not going to get the affirming that they are looking for from me. Um, I'm pretty clear in on my website. I don't do woke It's not something I bring into the therapy room. I am based on reality. I am based on what's real. I am not based on your truth or my truth. I am based on the truth. Um, So I make that clear. So again, that kind of does scare off the people who just want to be affirmed. Um, Now, I do get parents though. I I don't, I see some adolescents, but very select few. I kind of, I, I push that away out of my, private practice because it's, again, it's one of those things where I think it's a specialty and I, I can't specialize in too many things. So I've, I've decided sure. to kind of pull back from adolescence, but I do still get parents who call and say, help, my kid is hurting. They went to a therapist, came out of the therapist room, and now they think they're trans. And, you know, the questions that I ask is basically what happened before and what happened after. The kid was happy. Kid was okay. Kid was living life went to therapy and all of a sudden he wants to be a she. I don't understand. And that I can't, if there's something that gets me crying and so angry at the same time, it's that I, I tear up. I'm so hurt. I'm wounded. And I'm so angry that it's actually my profession that does this to these children. Because had we instead, and this is my, this is my philosophy on it. And my feeling about it. And it's it's interesting because I just sat in a convention yesterday listening to just this, the, the trans non-binary thing in the addiction world. Mm. I feel that there is this population of LGBTQ plus people that we keep looking at separately within each kind of um uh, situation or circumstance that people, so let me give you an example. Like if I'm going to go to an addictions uh, uh, conference, there's always like this one LGBTQ uh, session that says, you know, LGBTQ is an addiction. If I go to BPD conference to learn about uh, borderline personality disorders, there's always going to be that one session that's provided to the LGBTQ and bipolarism or excuse me, borderline personality and so forth and so forth, uh, so on. There's always that one session that dedicates to the LGBTQ community and how it relates to that diagnosis or specialty or whatever. So I'm like, well, let's step back here for a second. Is it that LGBTQ just happens to um, have a mental health disorder? Or is it that there's some kind of issue or problem or circumstance in their life that causes them to become LGBTQ? 
why can't we look at it that way? Why can't we have a whole conference based on the LGBTQ? Why can't it be conference on trauma that happens in the LGBTQ, the, the alphabets? I'm going to call it that for now, <laughs> if you don't mind. It's my tongue is getting very tired of it. So it's like, why can't we instead look at that population and go, what's going on here? Because the population by by letter is growing, the population by size is growing. We have these terms that are just like, what? And I know gays and lesbians that are like, I don't, what the heck is this? What are you guys lumping with me? This is not part of me. I'm not even a part of this. But there's got to be something that's creating this this huge rise in this population. Why aren't we looking at that? Why aren't we looking at trauma? Why aren't we looking at sexual abuse? Why aren't we looking at abuse? Why aren't we looking at grief? Why aren't we looking at those circumstances that perhaps contribute to this population growing in size? And is there a direct uh, correlation between the two? Is trauma, is some kind of abuse somehow related to these people turning around saying, I think I'm actually something else. I think I'm actually gay. I think I'm actually non-binary. Does that cause them to question themselves so much that they decide that there's some other identity, some other life force? Who knows? So I, I really feel that we're missing it here. I really feel yes. that if we could spend more time more money into the research and the studies. I really think we could find something here. I just know from just, you know, the, the friends that I've had that are in that community, um, the people that the very small amount of people that I've seen as far as uh, patients go, like in hospitals in that community, they've all had trauma. They've all had trauma, whether it be sexual trauma, whether it be abuse, neglect, foster care system trauma, they've all had it. And so can't we look at that? and say, what, what, how does that connect? Does it connect? Because we're willing to look at that when it comes to BPD, borderline personality. We're willing to look at it there. We're willing to totally look at it when it comes to addiction. 100% we're willing to look at it there. But not the gay and lesbian and the trans. Why not? Because they're protected. Because they're protected. Well, that I mean, that that's the answer. And I, I think to to take it further too is it's a worldview issue because in this worldview you you look at at your skin color you look at my skin color and as short of doing anything cosmetic that's a static thing we can't change that we're born with that it's the way it is I'm a male. You're a female. That's static. Now, they're really going against that right now. Um, fight as they will. We all know that that's true. Like, sex is innate. Um, that, that you can point to intersex, and they'll do that very often. But there's a, another rabbit hole for you, if you will. Um, short little trick here when you're – if you're arguing for something like that. Um, I do this often with abortion. Um Give if you're in a debate, you want a quick debate, give that to them. Say, okay, intersex that one percent or whatever, fine. But that th we'll call them trans for the sake of argument. I don't believe that, but let's mm -hmm. just give it to them and see if that changes their mind. That spoiler alert, it won't. Spoiler alert, if you say we'll give you the uh, uh, rape and incest for for abortion, and maybe that'll change the mind. It won't because it's not what it's about. It's an easy talking point. But it's not what it's about. They want to argue that any and every sexual trait is innate. And to suggest otherwise is, is bigoted and it's hate. And I disagree with that with every fiber of my being. I think it's actually very loving for to, to suggest what you're saying to, hey, maybe I'm wrong, but is it not worth asking questions, finding research? Can we help people? by digging deeper to figure out what's going on here. It, there's not a debate that LGBT whatever faces higher mental health issues. There's, I don't see anybody debating that. Why? <laughs> and we, we can't go into it. it. It's just discrimination because of people like you and me. And that's what gets into so, so scary with the trans stuff that 
God forbid, if my any of my kids came out as trans, and this worldview, I would be murdering them if I don't let them mutilate themselves. That's some messed up stuff. Like, how? Why are we at that point to where we think everything that has to do with your identity, sexual identity, everything is innate from the second you're born? I don't believe that. I, I, just, I just don't believe that at all. Right. And it's, it's amazing that we have been so numbed down as a population that we're just going with this, that we're just saying, yeah. oh, okay, my kid is supposed to be a girl. All right, I'll, I'll change. Like, how are we this numb? How in the world have we lost some sense of just morals and reality that we're okay with a three-year-old deciding they want to be a different gender? How? How have we done this to ourselves? And you're right. We have sit, sat there and brainwashed into, us into thinking it's innate. It's something that's just, you know, you just know. You just have it. It's inside of you from birth. You just, it's like, what? What do you mean we know? There's chromosomes. What do you mean we know? The chromosomes tells me what this person is. And that's, it's designed it that way. Everything that happens with this person's body, with hormones and the brain functioning, and every cell and DNA is based on those chromosomes. You don't get to just decide, I'm going to be something else. And everything in your body then follows. It doesn't. Obviously, there's going to be a war within you because chemically, there's a war that's happening inside of you. Why are we not stepping back and going, what makes a person think that? And a lot of times, the answer is going to be because society is what's making people think that. It's because of social pressures is what's making people think that. And we can't have anyone pointing fingers at the social world right now because we have to keep everyone in line and we've got to make sure everyone's okay and everyone votes the way we need them to vote. So it's it's sad, I but I am hopeful because I do believe more and more are waking up to this. It's yeah. unreal though, my God. Uh, yep. I mean, you're right. Uh, uh, another, uh, this one's a more lighthearted uh, social experiment. If you have little ones at home, like, like I do, um, try doing something like I, when you said three-year-old and then I, I saw a video the other day of a, a little boy that was like 18 months old, which that's younger than my son, who's 19 months old, which blows my mind. Like, He's wears diapers. Like I'm not listening to anything he's saying. What's what's wrong with you? Um, but anyways, if you go with a little kid and you suggest, do you want uh do you want chicken or fish? And they say fish. Okay, do you want fish or chicken? And they say chicken. You know, something like that. It's like yeah. that's what kids do. They don't know like they need you, they need you to guide them. And I, I don't know if you saw this, I don't believe you know, that he's this uh, sincere, great leader. But uh, the uh, the mayor of New York City, who is, again, I think very leftist. I, I disagree with him on, on basically everything. I think he's just trying to win some points. But he had this great speech the other day and was saying, we need to stop building a better world for our kids and start building better kids for our world. Like, yeah, that's... I, I'm with you. <laughs> Please, <laughs> more of that. that. Yes, yes, more of that. Yeah, because oh. they need adults. My children, they don't. I don't look to them at seven o'clock and like, hey, you ready to go to bed? No, they don't want to go to bed, but they need to because they need guidance from their parents. Right. We got to be the adults in the room here and not let the kids do it. And, you know, it's sad because I know that you and I, since we, we are licensed, we have these CPS rules. You know, we, it, you know, if a kid has sex with the, I don't know how it is in your state, but our state has funny, like if their kid is 14, has sex with a 16, it's reportable. But if the kid is 16 and has sex with a 17, it's not reportable. And just like right, these right. weird age gaps. And now I'm kind of like, are we even doing this still? Like, is this still a thing? Do I still report? I don't under I mean, this sounds really odd because if you guys are teaching preschoolers and kindergartners how to masturbate, one, why am I even caring if a 14 and a 14-year-old have sex? Please, I mean, obviously I care, 
but do I even report? I don't even understand. I don't, I, I don't get, do we even have 18 plus older strip joints? Because if kids are going to drag queen preschool hour, are they really strip clubs that are 18 and older now? Can kids go? Like, I just don't understand where the line is. And I think that's what the left doesn't get. They want no lines. They want everything yes. all over the place. If I feel this way today, that's where the line is. But God forbid I feel that way tomorrow because then we're going to have to move the line again. It's like, okay, come on. We have to have some straight lines here that are very clear boundaries, but they yes. just can't do it. That's like, no, you're stopping me from expressing myself. Like, I'm stopping you from creating a world that's dangerous right now. We are abusing these children. We are hurting them in so many ways. These poor kids, I almost look at them and go, I don't know what hope you have. I don't know. I don't know what kind of mental capacity you'll be able to have when you get older. I just know that we're going to have to do a huge job as therapists to help fix it. Because that's really what it's going to come down to, is us fixing a lot of this. And what's sad in our profession, unfortunately, fix a lot of the problems that we, we have caused, that we have been, and obviously saying we, the collective we of the profession, been right at the center of this. And it's it's really shameful. Um, there, there's actually some times um, that I've even, particularly in some of my conservative circles, like, yeah, I'm well, I'm a counselor. I'm like a real hush hush about it, uh, which I'm better about that now because I, I didn't do anything. But um, yeah, because there is kind of a shame attached. Like yeah. some of the what the ACA and the, the APA and uh, social workers, NASW, like some of what they say is nonsense, just yeah. complete nonsense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when they come out and apologize for a certain group of people like we're sorry to the black community that our white therapists have never I'm like what what don't what are we apologizing for i've never treated black people horribly i'm sure you haven't either i'm sure the person apologizing in a mass newsletter didn't do anything bad to black people either but we're all of a sudden collectively apologizing and making us feel like we've done something so horrible i've just all i'm doing is breathing i don't get it i'm loving everyone i'm letting them be who they want to be how is this, I have to walk around with this like shame on my shoulder for yeah. hurting people I've never met. Like what have we become as a profession? What is this victimhood mentality we're giving to everyone? This is horrible. We've got to stop this. We do. I'm, I, I'm hurt by what our profession has become. I'm embarrassed, just like you were describing. I'm embarrassed to call myself a licensed therapist. It's it's a part of me is just, it's shameful because I feel like when I say it, I have to immediately then say, but I'm not, I'm not one of them. Like I'm not, you know, I have to then give like, you know, example, like, hey, listen, I'm actually more sane. But it's, it's sad that we've come to this point. It's sad that we even have to come to a place where I have to put things on my website to say, I'm not woke, just to let you guys know you're safe to come over here. We never had to do anything like that. It was just about meeting a client where they're at in their life and helping them through. That's all it used to yes. be. But now, just like yeah. you said, there's tribalism. You know, it's like you're on our side or that side. Which side are you on? Yeah. And that's what's interesting about me forming this uh, this practice. Never had I any desire to be a Christian counselor previously. I had always been the mindset of, hey, I'm a Christian, kind of like you're saying uh, in your journey, journey. This is going to affect my value system. Um, it's going to affect kind of how I approach things, but I'll never be explicitly Christian. And I still think there's obviously ways to go about doing that. I'm not saying this is the only journey that, that I'm taking, but I'm sitting there with just all this craziness going on around me. And I'm thinking, okay, if I'm thinking through kind of that ideal client type of scenario, people that have similar values to you and I, and I'm sitting there and I'm trying to find a, and in fact, I'll even go a little bit more personal. I, I've, I've got a, a family member that, um, cousin that was just wrecked apart by a crazy woman that uh went deep into blm and, and all this stuff it, it's just messy 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 and 
saw a a counselor that was not helpful very much in this you know kind of woke mentality and i'm thinking of of this cousin they're not they're just not going to get help they are burned from the industry so let me i'm better off just staying alone and not talking to anybody because talking to a counselor is just going to make it worse i know that's not everybody but for a good chunk of people it is that is true so there's the argument of hey we're supposed to be apolitical we're supposed to not let our uh our own beliefs affect the client and to a great degree that's true but if they're not going to get treatment how is that how is that less ethical for me or how is it more ethical for me to be quiet about my beliefs so people don't get treatment as if I am a little bit open and say, hey, this is the perspective I'm coming from. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to be on my my side, but this is my perfect my, my uh, perspective. Take it or leave it. How is that not ethical? Right. That, I, I got lambasted by some people locally, kind of a local activist group. Um, saying that I was hateful, discriminatory. Like, I have the most succinct informed consent in the area. Nobody knows as much about their therapist as they know about me. I'm an open book. I, I ripped my, uh, my church's st- uh, statement of faith and put it on my website. And, and again, have on there. You don't have to believe this. But this is kind of my worldview. If you like that, great. If you don't, and I always tell clients, I'll help you find somebody else. I'll go through psychology today and say, hey, that maybe this will be a better fit for you. I'm cool with doing that. Like, that's not unethical. You can call yeah. it that if you want to, but that's not unethical. I 100% agree. And it's, it's, it's hypocritical that we have LGBTQ therapists, that we yeah. have Black therapists for black people we have what's that b-i-p-o-c yeah, yes it's, yes it's, you know, we means. have all these therapists for that population but yep. god forbid i come out and say well i'll be a conservative therapist for conservatives oh my you're a bigot how your your ethics are wrong how are you even a therapist i'm gonna go tell your board you're like wait what you're you're literally saying that you're allowed to specialize by population. Okay, so then I'm going to provide the same thing. I'm going to specialize in a population. But we were horrible people, Johnny. You and I are so apparently just the devil itself. I mean, we are just poison to these people for some reason. And all because, not because we hate them, not because we think they're just the worst things on this planet, but all because we're like, listen. What we're doing to our children is not healthy. We are causing more harm than good. And if we don't have some sort of structure, some kind of moral compass in place and in line that's that's stable throughout time, we are going to be causing more damage. We are going to be hurting more people. Let's stop indoctrinating and instead do what our profession has asked us to do. Help. That's it. Just meet the client where they're at and help them in their needs, not provide some kind of indoctrination. Yeah. And and I I, I do a pretty good job of not letting uh, some of those just crazy comments that that I've received um, not affect me too personally. But it's that was it was just such a I've again, kind of like when I was uh, I had to leave my job. Um, I've never had those type of that level, that that viciousness of personal attacks, attacking my character and everything. Um, I have uh, on my full time job um, that I'm still working. I have people that I disagree with all the time that in my my private practice, I probably would approach a little bit differently because my informed consent's different. But I'm in a different role. I'm not. This isn't truth and grace counseling where I, I, I'm out at, at an employee job. So I treat it different. And I think that that's the ethical way to go about it because they didn't sign up for Christian counseling over there. So I'm not going to force that on them. I think that's, again, it's ethical. But that, that's, again, the thing with the, the activists. They don't care about the logical conclusion. It's you're evil, so therefore you should end. Right. <laughs> and right. it's... 
there is a piece there too with conservatives. I, I think we need to do a better job of with that that situation. I really learned, hey, I can I, I don't need to let them just run over me. I, I can stand up for myself. But there does come a point where you just got to hit that block button and move on because there's no reasoning with that. I, I can't just sit and give this five bullet point thing. Oh, what do you think about that? Oh, you're a bigot. Like you can't have an argument with that. You just got to let them be and move on your merry way. Exactly. Just, just keep scrolling. Like I said, just keep scrolling or just push the unfollow button. Like it's, it's really yep. that simple. You, you can't save yep. everyone. You're not called to everyone. Just, just move on. Just take care of yourself. Yeah. That's it. it- and and we we've got to do a better job of that because um, yeah, like you're saying earlier, you get your feelings hurt and everything. We're humans, like I get it, but it's a baseless attack. There's nothing that's going to happen from that. Honestly, if they came from my board or from my license, I've got malpractice insurance for a reason. They'd have no claim on me whatsoever. It'd be stressful. We'd make it because I didn't do anything wrong. And that's a freeing feeling, knowing you've not done anything wrong, and you can just let them be what they're going to be. Exactly. And I think more therapists need to understand that, that, that sure, they'll come after you. Sure, they'll try. And it's going to be stressful. You're going to get anxiety. It's, you're going to tremor in some kind of way. It's going to happen. But you didn't do anything wrong. You did nothing wrong. It wasn't a client that called the board. It was just some leftist that's bored and hates you and decided to take yeah. it out on you. That's it. That's all it is. And, and okay, so be it. Let them have it. Whatever. Well, hey, I think this has been a fabulous conversation that, and it's really hit the things that I want my audience to hear of, hey, let's not underestimate. Things are bad. There are a lot of bad things going on. Um, I know we really got into that here at the end, especially we don't want to understate that. Like you're not making things up. There are really rough things going on, but you can do something about it. You may not make a huge impact and save the world, but could you change a, a, a neighbor's mind? Could you set your own practice up in a certain way? Could you get some, some side income and help people out in another way? Yeah. There, there's things that you can do. So don't live in despair. Um, and yeah, be creative. Just do new things and enjoy life. That that's that's really a piece that I think we we just missed. That goodness, and I, I know as Christians, we we believe this that your life is so short; it's going to be over tomorrow. Um, it, enjoy the time you have and impact people around us. Don't just be a grumpy Gus all day. Like do do something good with your life and. Make those that hate you um, see the smile you have on your face while they're trying to trying to stone you. Um, maybe that'll make them think twice, just seeing the joy that you have in your life and just the misery they have in their life. So, amen. Anyways, amen. that's that's where I would like to leave that with. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Johnny, for having me. It was so nice being able to talk to a fellow conservative. It's just it's a nice feeling. To just even, you know, if you disagree with one another or agree, it's just nice to have a conversation with someone yes. about these things. Yes. So just yes. thanks for facilitating that. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, I- any lasting uh, words or information that you would like my audience to know about you? Honest to God, it, the only thing that I can say is I just, I like you finished off on your um, talk there, is don't be in despair. You have a call. There is something that you are here on this planet to do. Uh, You have been designed for a time and purpose such as this. Please don't let the weight of the world just stop you from doing what it is you're called to do. And if myself or if Johnny or if somebody else who can encourage you, please reach out so that we can just be your biggest cheerleaders and just say, you got this. We're, We're here for you. It's fine. You can do this. I just don't want people to get stuck in in the sadness of anything. Please, that is not, your calling is not to sit still. Your calling is to get up and, and somehow bless this world in some way. Just remember, your blessings are not for you. They're always for other people. Your blessings are just like joy that you get to fill your heart with, but they're used to help others too. So please don't sit dormant. Go Go do something. And if you want help, we're here. Come get it. I love it. 
Absolutely. So I'll, I'll leave all of Soed's information, her socials, her website, all, all of that so you can go check her out. And yeah, I really appreciate you being on and um, I, I definitely see us connecting again in the future. Absolutely. Thanks again, Johnny. All right. You're welcome. Take care. The last word. Today's last word is accountable. Now, if you grew up in the church and Christian circles, you probably have heard about accountability groups. That's kind of where my mind goes usually when I hear, hear that word accountable. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that accountability groups have a good idea in mind that they're trying to be a band of brothers for, for men to hold each other accountable with, with things that they're doing at home or in their personal lives. I know women do the same thing. Um, typically, those are best if they are uh, gendered that way, men with men, women with women. And I think there's some benefits that have happened from accountability groups. But accountability goes much deeper than that. I can sit there and tell somebody that I'm eating breakfast with, yeah, things are great. Things are going good. And in all actuality, they're not. I'm really excited that somebody that I'm partnering with is a group called Accountable to You. And this group, they help provide accountability through your computers, which just to be frank, um, I'm not getting on to anybody because honestly, a majority of people watching this have probably either viewed pornography or are currently a- addicted to it. It's a problem that goes beyond just the world. It, it very much affects the church, even including pastors. So what I love about Accountable to You is they're not just fully in this shame base of how dare you do this, what's wrong with you, although there's a piece of that that needs to be there. Accountable to You, it helps provide opportunities for your your spouse, your loved ones, people in your church to know that they have full access to what you're watching on the internet. And if they have full access, that probably going to decrease your odds of viewing something that you know don't need to see. And again, I, I want to emphasize that I'm not coming from a spirit of how dare you or uh, that you know, that, that you're just a, the worst person ever if you struggle with pornography or not even pornography, just, just other things that you're watching on or looking at on the internet that, that you shouldn't be. I've actually had a unique experience here recently that through Truth and Grace Counseling, I've resurrected my Facebook. I have a new YouTube account, a new Google account. So I'm really viewing some different websites through a different lens. Now, my my kind of personal uh, Gmail and everything, the algorithm's really gotten through things. And by and large, the ads and everything that I see on there are, are pretty tame because I've if you don't know this, you should on some of those advertisements, if they pop up and they're inappropriate, you can click not interested or inappropriate or whatever, and it's not going to show it. So there's tools at your disposal, even beyond accountable to you, that that you just need to be wise and use. And my normal accounts have really have gotten years of that. And like I said, it's pretty tame. But some of these new accounts, it's free game. And I'll tell you, a lot of these advertisements, it's shocking of how risque and, and blatant. Um, I just got an Instagram for Truth and Grace Counseling and just some of the the uh, accounts on there that are clearly not real real women, but the body parts they're, they're showing and everything, it's not good. So my point of saying all of that is there's temptation around you at, at all times. There's been temptation forever in this world, but with with smartphones especially, uh, with sexual sin, there is temptation all the way around. But I want to just focus on, on pornography and that side. Accountability goes further than that. I'm accountable for how I lead my family. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm accountable for the way that my children behave up to a degree. That's, that's my responsibility. And how sad is it that many in our society not just struggle with issues, but don't feel any responsibility, don't feel any accountability at all, just don't care. 
They, they don't care what happens with their kids. They don't care how they lead their their wives. And I'm talking specifically to men here. Don't get me wrong. W- women have their own set of issues um, that I don't feel fully qualified to to talk about. But for men, we can complain about how bad women are. We can complain about all the issues that they might bring up. But mind you, God made men to lead. And, and I know that's not very very politically correct, particularly in the, in this society, but it's true. So men, if you don't like the way that things are going in your life, what are you going to do about it? Because some of that accountability is not just about pornography and all, all, all those bad things. It's also being accountable for doing something. You don't have to figure it all out. So, so what and I talked about in our conversation, you don't have to figure out all the problems in the world, but you got to do something. So I'm talking to you, particularly men. You're sitting there, you're miserable, you don't know where your life is going. I don't have the secret answer. I can't tell you exactly how things are going to go perfect in your life. But I could tell you sitting there alone on a Saturday night, going to Pornhub.com, it's not going to do the trick. It's it's not just, oh, that's a bad thing to do. It's making you miserable. You're becoming a slave to your own sin. Put the Put the phone away. If you're not going to do accountable to you and and stay accountable that way, throw your phone away. I'm not being facetious here. I'm being serious. Do whatever you can and then do something. Again, you may not figure it all out, but can you get a step closer? Maybe this isn't your dream job, but it's is it better than what you're doing right now? Be accountable for your actions. Be accountable for the mess that your life is in right now, and then be accountable for making it better. There is an aspect here, particularly of of those that are Christians, that yes, we believe God is in control, and we need to have faith in that. But again, looking at accountability, are you thanking God for that? Are Are you praising Him? Are you picking up the Word every day? Are you praying? We are just in such a world of blaming of other people. We talked about victim blaming and, and, and things like that in this culture that many on the right get upset about for, for good reason. But the right is just as guilty as the left as far as whining and complaining about how bad things are. Do something. Be accountable for your actions. Set goals and do it. Stop overcomplicating it and just do something. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of the Truth and Grace Counseling Podcast. I've included SOAD's information down below, her socials, and her website. Please thank her for coming on the show, being such a great guest, and check out her information. I've also included those links about direct primary care, about my doctor, Dr. Rose Kelly. That's all down below as well. And also Brocro, who made this awesome polo shirt for me today. If you enjoyed this show and want to help support this show and keep it going, there's a few tangible things that you can do. First like this video. Takes about this long to just click that thumbs up button. Or if you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any audio type of platform, giving me a five-star review. If you want to put nice words on there, great. But even just clicking those five stars, it goes a long way. Aside from that, you can also share this show either on YouTube by posting this link on your socials or if on my socials on Facebook or Instagram, Twitter. If I share it, click and retweet or reshare it on Facebook or what have you. And also sharing just the traditional way with your words, telling your friends and family, making a Facebook post about it, sharing it on Instagram. Those little things, they go a really, really long way just towards spreading the show and getting it in front of more eyeballs. If you're interested about the show or you have a guest that you think would be interested, let me know. Um, I, I have that form down below about feedback. You're always welcome to fill that out. The last bit, if you want to help me out financially as well, I've got uh, just a direct donate button that you can always give to me. I also strongly encourage you to visit my website, truthgracecounselingpodcast.com. It's got all the show notes. It's got my good stuff section, which has just some some neat information, subscription services and books and things like that for affiliate marketing. And it's got 
all of the episodes on there, both both YouTube versions and so has links all to the the podcast as well. And like I said, it's got the donate section there too. So multiple means that you can help the show out. But again, just you being here, click and like. I encourage you to to comment any uh, both praises and criticisms. If you hate the show and you want to tell me, hey, let me know in the comments. That helps the algorithm too. As much as you hate the show, it really does help out that way too if you, you type out some of those hateful comments too. All that being said, thanks for joining me and I'll catch you on the next episode.